with a grateful heart give thanks to the holy one give thanks because he's given jesus christ his son i'm a member of the saint john's Quanus club has anybody ever heard of Qantas? Some of you have. It's a service club. We do a lot of good projects to help people in the community. Sometimes we're hands-on, right? And we're, we're right in there. We're doing stuff, helping things get done, such as maybe when we like cook hot dogs for the national night out down at the park or when we lead in the action club, which works with mentally and physically challenged individuals to do service projects and other fun events. Other times, we are supportive by contributing money to help with a cause. For instance, a couple of weeks ago, we donated $1,000 to Liquid Fertilizer, their IQ Hub, which helps a lot of people understand agriculture and farming. Last week, we donated $500, contributed $500 to Safe Center, which is an organization in Clinton and Shiawassee counties that helps those who are going through domestic violence or sexual abuse. But at Kiwanis, we're not always united. You know, sometimes it gets ugly because of a particular rivalry that's going on there. One side says something, you know, to the, to the other side, and then the other side has to chirp up, and we just kind of go at each other like that. Well, what kind of rivalry would cause this kind of eruption in our club, you might wonder? Well, it is the ongoing rivalry between those who support MSU and those who support U of M. <laughs> you know, it's, it's serious stuff. Well, in our club, we have this th fun thing we call happy dollars, and that's where members will contribute a dollar or two. They put it in the jug, and then they get to share about what makes them happy for that day or maybe even for that week. And so many of us, we share about family things going on, or maybe we share about successes at work, or maybe someone will comment on the presenter who spoke about their organization at our club meeting that morning. Well, one member of our club, his name is Rod. I, I think you might know him, Danielle. <laughs> it's her father-in-law. But uh, anyway, uh, Rod, he, is, he always loves to talk about positive things that he's happy about. But then he's always bragging about how good U of M is doing in their sports. And even if U of M isn't doing particularly well in sports that week, he will say something like, but you know what? Their tiddlywinks team did really great. <laughs> I don't think they have a tiddlywinks team, but anyway. But Rod is a big fan of U of M, and he always ends his happy dollar comments with, go blue, right? And then that starts, of course, a bunch of banter in the club, and then you start hearing, go green, go white, you know, and... Well, it's all in good fun, though. But as I think about that rivalry, I am realizing that when it comes to a rivalry, you have to choose a side, don't you? That's just how rivalries work. I mean, we're, we're in week four of our series, 2020 Vision, The Intentional Church. And I'm loving this series because we're looking seriously at what Jesus' followers should be like. And how does who we are overflow into Christ's church. You know, in the New Testament, Jesus talks about how we are to be generous with our lives. He talks about how we are to be generous with our resources. But then he tells us that when it comes to being generous, there is a rival for your heart. He tells us who our chief competitor is, and it might surprise you, to understand who your chief competitor is, it's probably not who you think. Jesus tells us clearly that yours and my chief competitor, spiritual competitor, is mammon. Okay? And we're going to be in Matthew chapter 6 for most of our time today. And as we read through that text where Jesus talks about mammon, I want you to, to listen for the rivalry language that Jesus Uses. So open up your Bible or your smartphone to Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. It's the first book in the New Testament. And Jesus says there, no one can serve two masters. Now let me just stop there for a moment. No one can serve two masters. 
Now, at first you might think, well, what's the big deal about this? But stop and think about it. Have you ever had to work for two bosses at the same time? Uh, that's, that's kind of miserable, isn't it? Or guys, have you ever tried dating two women at the same time? And then one of them finds out, and then it's like, done, right? Or when it comes to a sports team, you have to pick a side, otherwise you're just kind of sitting there at the game, and it's like, eh, who cares? Well, this is Jesus' point. No one can serve two masters. And then he goes on to say, either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. And you know what? That happens every single time. You have to choose a side. And then in the very next sentence, Jesus shares with us who our chief competitor is. This is where he says, you cannot serve both God and mammon. Now, if you're looking at your Bible, your Bible probably uses the word money instead of mammon. Am I right? Okay, I'm seeing some heads nod. Now, in my Bible, there is a footnote explaining that the word translated money in the English is the Greek word for mammon. So the exact word that would have come out of Jesus' mouth in the first century is that word mammon. Well, the question is, what is mammon? Mammon is an Aramaic word that's hard to find a good English equivalent for. And so they translate it money, which isn't a bad translation. It's just that our English word money might be a little bit too simple of a word to describe what Jesus is really getting at here in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. Because you see, the thing about money is that it is a thing that is neither good nor evil, right? Money is neither good nor evil. Money is neutral. And you can use money for the greatest good, or you can use money for something that's really bad. Now, you might be thinking, but doesn't the Bible say that money is the root of all evil? Well, not really. It's often interpreted that way. But this idea comes from 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. And hold your finger in Matthew chapter 6. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. And that says, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. So what's that verse really saying? Well, here's some money. Okay, I got some money with me here tonight, this morning. And what we see is... It's just kind of made of paper. It's kind of a cloth paper almost. And you don't really love a piece of paper, do you? I mean, when you stop and think about it. I've never heard anybody say, well, you know what? I love the intricate design of this dollar bill. And I, I just love the detail that's in the, you know, in the picture that's on this dollar bill. It's amazing. I've never really heard anybody say anything like that. Well, what is it that we love about money? It's what money gives us, right? It's what money brings into our life. That's the kind of thing that we love about money. The meaning of the word mammon in the Greek language, it refers to something in which we trust. Now, in my study Bible and in some of the commentaries that I read prep, uh, preparing for the message, it says that mammon refers to material possessions that have become an idol. And an idol is something you worship, right? When Jesus was referring to mammon, he was referring to something that was spiritual as well as material. It's not just material. It has this spiritual aspect to it. And he was talking about a false god that is vying for control of your heart. It is vying for control of your mind. And it wants all of you. That's what mammon is. And so if you were to Google the words mammon images, it will show you some pictures that kind of will creep you out a little bit. So, for instance, here's, here's a picture of mammon. There's mammon right there. <clears throat> and here's another picture of mammon, how an illustrator depicted it. And then here's another picture of mammon. And you can see just give, kind of giving devotion to it, right? It's... Mammon is vying for everything that you are. Now, if we were to come up with a definition for mammon, I think we could define it like this. 
Mammon is the false god that promises you something. What does it promise you? It promises you that you can trust money to give you what only God can. That's the definition of mammon. And here's the problem with that. Mammon is a liar, okay? Mammon cannot deliver on its promise, and yet we constantly fall into its trap. Mammon, for instance, promises you security, right? How many of you have ever thought, you know, if only I had just this much more money in my bank account, then I would be secure. I'd be set for life, right? Mammon promises you significance. You know, it's like if you had just a little bit more money, if you had that better car, those nicer clothes, that, that bigger house, then you'd be significant, and people would listen to you more, and they'd respect you more, right? Mammon promises you the marriage that you've always wanted. And it's like if you just had a little bit more money, then you and your spouse wouldn't fight about money anymore, and you'd have the marriage that you always wanted. You'd be able to give your kids all those things that, that you have always desired for them. And so mammon promises you happiness, and it promises you joy, and it promises you peace of life. And yet, here's the thing, only God can give you ultimate security. Only God can give you that kind of significance that you're really looking for. Only God can give you the marriage that you've always dreamed of. Only God can give you happiness and joy and peace in life. And yet mammon promises you that if you just had a little bit more money, then you'd be able to do all of those things on your own. And the problem is, where's God in all of this? And we, we often feel we're left with nothing. You see, the truth of the matter is, mammon doesn't fulfill his promises. And it's leading to huge fights and cracks in relationships and in separations and to all kinds of stress because we don't handle our money very well. But what would happen if we searched the scriptures to see what they say about money and about managing it well? You know, have you ever looked into the Bible to see what it has to say about managing your money? See, this is why I love the Bible's take on money. Because it will, for one thing, it'll give you rock-solid insights about how to actually manage your money. For instance, things like don't go into debt. <laughs> that is just not a good thing. Or principles like, you know, be careful how you spend your money. Or principles like make sure you save up some money because hard times will come. It's not a matter of if they come, it's when they come will you be prepared. And there are all those kinds of insights into managing our money well. But here's the thing, with the Bible, it goes beyond that. And so in the Bible, we read how there is this powerful spiritual component to handling your money as well, that you have to choose. You have to choose your priorities and what you're going to live for. So are you going to live with contentment and the peace that brings? Or are you always going to be chasing after that almighty dollar, that next dollar, and living with the stress that comes with that? See, you've got to decide, right? Are you going to live for your money and possessions, or are you going to live for God and his higher purpose so that others can be blessed through you? When you discover the Bible's principles for money management, I'm telling you, it will actually draw you closer to the God who owns it all to begin with. When you discover Scripture's insights about handling your money well, it has the power to save your marriage. It has the power to get you out of that crushing credit card debt. It has the power to help you to live your life with more energy and joy. Now, I could stand up here for the next six weeks and share with you in detail about what does the Bible teach us for managing our money and our finances well. And you know, as I think about that, maybe what we ought to do is launch a, a workshop in the fall that would kind of share some of those principles with us and help us to manage our money in a more appropriate way and, and more effectively. But, but today, I want to just focus on two principles from the Bible that if you will embrace these and how you handle your money... It will transform your life by pulling mammon's grip off of you 
and allowing you and redirecting your heart and your devotion to God. So here's principle number one. That is, your heart always follows your money. You've got to understand that principle. Your heart always follows your what? Your money. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought much about this before, but Jesus points this out in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. He says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, right? And by treasure, what Jesus means is every single penny, every asset, every single thing that you own, everything that's titled in your name, that is your treasure. And when Jesus talks about your heart, he's talking about this idea of what you are devoted to, what, what you're living for. When Jesus was once asked, what's the greatest commandment in all of the law, he responded with the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart. And so in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is telling us, I want all of your heart, but you have to understand how this works. Because wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It's like whatever treasure or money you have, there is this chain and it's connecting it to your heart. And wherever your money goes, your heart, it goes along with it. And we probably already know that this is true. I mean, just look at your own budget. Take your spending from the last month, everything that you spent money on, and what is the largest expense that you have, which is probably the same for all of us. It's probably your house, right? Your mortgage, or if you live in an apartment, your rent. And I think that's why TV shows like HGTV and Fixer Upper and This Old House have become so popular in recent years because your heart just kind of goes there. And then you think about your house all the time. There's a big chunk of your change attached to that. Or if it's not your house, maybe it's your car or your truck. You know, you got that new truck and you're washing it all the time and you're taking care of it. And then, have you ever noticed when you get a particular car or truck, all of a sudden you start seeing it everywhere, right? You're going down the highway, hey, there's, there's my vehicle. Hey, you see it in the driveway of somebody else's house. And you never noticed it before. You never paid much attention to it before. But now that you have some investment in that particular vehicle, now you start to notice it everywhere you go. Or if it's not that, it might be the stock market. Maybe you never paid attention to stocks before in your life. But now you've bought into something and you keep looking to see if your investment is growing. How many of us with 401ks are feeling a little bit anxious right now as the news constantly talks about the stock index and how it's just kind of like plunging because of the coronavirus, right? Well... I'm not all that concerned about it, but still, now we start to pay attention to that stuff, right? Because we've got money invested. Maybe you're sitting there thinking, well, you know, Tyler, pff, I don't really spend a lot of money on things. I don't really spend a whole lot of money on myself because all my money is spent on my kids. <laughs> you know, and there's, there's clothes and there's food and there's sports equipment and subscriptions and tablets and birthday parties and toys and the, the list just goes on and on, right? But maybe that explains why so many families are totally child-centered, right? Everything revolves around the kids. Well, what's my point here? I'm not trying to say that you shouldn't have a house. I'm not saying you shouldn't buy a car or a truck. I'm not saying you shouldn't spend money on your kids or your grandkids. The only point I want you to see here is that there is this chain that connects your money to your heart. And wherever your money goes, your heart, it will follow. And because God created us and he knows this dynamic, Jesus says to us, I want you to love God with all your heart. Well, what simple command do you think God could put all throughout the Bible so that he has our hearts? You know, it's not like God needs our money or something. God's loaded. I mean, if, he's, if, if it's true that he is paving streets with gold, what more could we give to him? You know what I'm saying? God doesn't need your money, but he demands your heart. God is going to give us a specific principle that assures that every single time we get paid, 
Mammon isn't going to control our heart. He does. And so if our treasure is connected to our heart, God is going to put some kind of a principle in place. And here's the principle. This is number two when it comes to being intentional about being generous. Tithing ensures that God has your heart, not mammon. Now, it's the principle of the tithe. And some of us, we fight it, you know. Just the mention of the word offends us. It makes us cringe, doesn't it? But here's the thing. All tithing is, is that every time you get paid, the first check, not the second or the third, the first check you write is the tithe check, where you give back 10% to God through your giving to the church. And you know what that does? It redirects your heart back to God. Listen, Satan will do anything he can to get the church to not tithe. And here's why. He knows that it will release the grip of mammon over you and redirect your heart to God. And you know why so many people struggle with tithing? Here's why we struggle. We sit down and we work out our budget. When we make up our minds, we're going to do this because we see this principle all throughout the scriptures. And then when we are filling in our budget and we're adding all, in all the numbers and we're adding into that budget, you know, the, the tithe, all of a sudden that bottom line number in our budget goes from positive to negative. And that's when we usually start praying to God, right? We start saying something like, you know, God, I want to tithe. I just can't afford to do it right now. But when I get a little more money, then I can start to tithe. And you know who that is talking? It's mammon. Mammon promises, right? That if you make just a little bit more money, that'll be the answer to all of your problems. Remember from earlier? That's one of mammon's false promises. But what would happen if you stepped out in faith right now and you began to tithe and you saw God miraculously meet all of your needs? Would that not transform your heart with regard to who you trust? You know, God versus mammon? Of course it would. Listen, I, I've never heard, never have I heard someone say to me, man, my finances are a horrible mess because I started tithing and it just ruined everything. I've never, ever heard that. You know why? You know why you won't hear that? It's because when it comes to your finances, 90% with God goes farther than 100% on your own. And it's just always, it works that way. And so that takes your heart trusting in God, not in mammon. And when it comes to your money, you have to decide which perspective you're going to take. Am I going to trust God or am I going to trust money? It's a matter of perspective. I heard about one dad who was teaching his, his daughter the principle of the tithe. And he pulled $10 out of his pocket, right? And he, he held them in front of her and he said, Honey, I want to teach you the principle of the tithe right now. And uh, here's what it means to tithe. He says, when you get ten of these together, he says, you take one of these and you give it to God. And that's what the tithe is. And here's where the innocence of a child shows up. Because she got real big-eyed all of a sudden. And she said, Daddy, you're telling me that you only gave one dollar to God and you kept the other nine for yourself? <laughs> I love that, you know, because it's a matter of perspective, isn't it? Who are we going to trust? What is your perspective when it comes to being generous? Listen, you cannot outgive the God of the universe. He's the biggest giver of all. He gave us his son, right? For God so loved the world that he gave us his son, Jesus. He gave. And you have to understand something. This isn't a message about, you know, give to God. And I'm not saying, hey, you know what? If you give to God, he's going to give you back a whole bunch more stuff. I'm not saying that at all. But here's the thing when it comes to giving. You got to understand that when God blesses your giving, it's not about blessing you for your sake. It's about blessing you so that you can give to the things that God cares about. And today, I'm not even really, really talking about giving so much as I'm talking about 
who's going to have your heart? And here's what I know to be true. God will never have your full heart until you begin to give generously. And when you begin to give generously, that's when God will receive your heart in all of its fullness. And that's when you might just find yourself underneath God's funnel of generosity and blessing. But then, again, it's not so that you can be the recipient and just take that all for yourself. It's about God finding someone who will take his resources and use them for the things that he cares about. And that's when you really start trusting God at the next level up, rather than mammon. As we close this morning, I just want to ask you a question. Who has your heart? Is it God or is it mammon? Remember the principles for intentional generosity. Number one, your heart always follows your what? Your money. Number two, tithing ensures that God has your what? Your heart. God will never have your heart till you start tithing. So what is God calling you to do today? Is he calling you to be more generous with the resources he's blessed you with? Is he calling you, you know, to give more of your heart to him? You have to decide how you're going to do that. Because, see, this is part of what seeing clearly is all about. When it comes to being an intentional church and having that 2020 vision about what God desires for his church, you got to be able to see it clearly. Are you serious about connecting people to God and to one another? And when you start to see God's purposes clearly and you start to act on that, that's when the whole earth will start to fill with his glory. People will begin to bow down and worship him because he's awesome and he's holy and he's almighty. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, right now we recognize you as the owner of everything. And we know that what you care about the most is our heart. Are we fully devoted to you? Or are we going to just continue to live with one foot planted in this world and one foot planted in the church? Father, we desire to be faithful to you in all ways. To love others and to serve faithfully and to grow intentionally and to be faithful in our generosity. Because that's how you were for us. And that's the message that Jesus taught. Thank you for your love. May your favor and blessing go with each person here today. In Jesus' name we pray and ask all these things. And God's people said, Amen. Because of what the Lord